If you want to reflash your GM vehicle using the HP Tuners software, you're going to need to understand how the PCM deals with ignition control. In this short lesson, we'll have a look at how the ignition timing is controlled and we'll see how to use the scanner to decide how and where to make changes to our ignition tables. For our lesson, we're going to be using a 2013 HSV Club Sport R8 fitted with a GM LS3 6.2 litre V8. Now this is going to be applicable to a wide range of both Australian and US domestic market vehicles. So let's jump in the car and take a look. When it comes to optimising the ignition timing, one of the first things we need to know is where exactly the PCM is accessing in our spark advance tables at any particular time. So essentially whereabouts the spark advance values are coming from. If we know this accurately, then this allows us to uh, make our changes to the advance table in the correct spots. And this is going to mean we're going to get the right results when we're flashing the ECU and we're going to get the right results on the dyno. Now for those uh, new to the GM platform, it can be a little bit uh, confusing to figure out exactly where we are operating in the Spark Advance map. And the reason for this is the load axis that the PCM uses. So let's have a quick look in our uh, VCM editor software. And if we bring up our high octane Spark Advance map, we have a map of ignition advance angles which looks relatively straightforward, uh, particularly for anyone coming from an aftermarket standalone ECU tuning background, this would look relatively normal. We can look at the graph in three dimensions and again we have a relatively uh, sensible shape to that particular graph. Now the axes that we have here, on our x-axis we have our engine RPM or spark RPM as it's listed here. That again makes a lot of sense. The load axis though we have here is the bit that can be a little bit confusing initially and it's listed as spark air mass in grams. Now what this is is grams per cylinder mass airflow and this is the way the GM PCM measures load. So we need to know whereabouts we're operating in this spark table. The RPM is relatively straightforward, but we also need to look at what our mass airflow in grams per cylinder is so we can see where exactly we're operating on that load axis. Let's have a look at our scanner and we'll see how we can use that to help us. Alright we've got our engine running and we've got the scanner operating and we just want to talk about a few of the key parameters that we're going to be looking at here. First of all we have on our charts here we have our engine RPM relatively easy to explain. We've also got a couple of parameters here that we're going to be looking at when we're running the car. First of all we have in white our spark advance and this is the final ignition advance being delivered to the engine. So if we actually fitted a timing light to number one coil this is the timing we should actually see when the engine's running. Above that we have in red our KR parameter which stands for knock retard. We're going to be looking at that parameter once we actually run the engine. Now the other aspect that I've added here, the parameter that I've added here is cylinder air mass in grams per cylinder and you can see that that parameter is also listed over on the left in our channels list. So this is a parameter that I've actually added in there, it's, uh, it's not uh, scanned or logged by default so if we want to see where our, uh, what our grams per cylinder mass airflow is then we need to add this parameter. Let's do a run on our dyno so we've actually got some data that we can look at and then we'll talk about how to interpret that data. So that's our run complete, we ended up with 250 kilowatts at the rear wheels or 336 horsepower. What we're really interested in looking at though is the data that we collected during that run in our VCM scanner software, so let's have a look at that now. Now there's a lot of data here, we're only going to really focus on a few key aspects. We've got our engine RPM at the top as we've already discussed and you can see our run is displayed here, we've gone from about 1500 RPM through to about 6500. If we move down and we look at our spark advance and our knock retard, you can see our white line uh, showing us the ignition timing being delivered to the engine. 
We can actually see that we did have some knock activity on this particular run at 5300 RPM. You can see that the PCM was removing 2 degrees of ignition timing in response to a knock event. So this indicates that the uh, engine was suffering from knock during the run and the PCM was responding to that to safeguard the engine. At the bottom we've got our cylinder EMS and you can see the purple line showing what our cylinder EMS is doing at any particular point. Now we can use the parameters engine RPM and cylinder EMS to uh, figure out where exactly we were at any particular point in our ignition advance table. So these are the, the aspects we need in order to pinpoint whereabouts we were operating in our ignition advance table. Let's have a look for example if we move through to 2800 RPM and you can see at 2800 RPM we were operating at 0.68 grams per second. Let's jump through to our VCM editor software and at 2800 RPM you can see that we're operating at 0.68 grams per second. Now we have a value of 25 degrees ignition timing in the table here in our main high octane ignition table and if we go through to our scanner we can see that in fact we did have 25 degrees being uh, delivered to our engine. Now even though we've pinpointed where we're operating in the table, the final advance that we actually see in our scanner still might differ somewhat from what we have in our main uh, advance, high octane advance table. And we're going to talk about why that might be in a second. First of all though, let's move our histograms into view and we'll see how we can use our histograms to help us see where we're actually operating in our Spark Advance table as well, as well as logging the values, the actual final ignition advance values being delivered to the engine. So what we've got here is our Spark Advance histogram and this is the default histogram as displayed. Now as it is displayed right now it's not actually a lot of use to us. We can see we have engine RPM on our horizontal axis which is great, that matches our Spark Advance table. However you can see that the load axis we have is manifold absolute pressure. Now remember we're using uh, mass airflow in grams per cylinder so this doesn't actually help us. You can see that the whole run that we've created there at wide open throttle while we were doing our ramp run on the dyno, it's constantly sitting between about 95 and uh, 90 kPa, so this is what we'd expect at wide open throttle. So that doesn't help us figure out where we were operating in our Spark Advance table. Let's see how we can quickly and easily manipulate this histogram to be a little bit more useful to us. If we right click and we go to the graphs layout, we can alter, uh, modify the graphs that are already available or add our own custom histograms. So you can see at the moment I've got our Spark Advance histogram highlighted. We've got all of the uh, setup parameters for that particular histogram listed on the right. You can see that the parameter we're actually logging into uh, this histogram is Spark Advance. Now what we want to do is come down here to our row axis and we want to change the parameter that's being used as our row axis. We can do that simply by clicking on it. And now we've got a couple of ways we can choose the parameter that we want to use for our load axis. One of the easiest ways is simply to start typing the name of the particular parameter we want. So you can see I've typed in cylinder here. Uh, all of the parameters with the name cylinder within the title uh, are going to now be displayed and if we simply come down we can see that we have cylinder EMS and we can click on that and the cylinder EMS uh, parameter will now be used as our row axis. Alternatively we can also navigate through the menu structure and find the particular parameter that we want to use this way. So if we go through engine and then airflow and then cylinder we can see we have the same parameter being displayed here. Okay so we're not quite done now, even though we have cylinder EMS as our load axis, we still as you can see have uh, manifold absolute pressure values as our break points and that's not going to help us so we need to change that. Now, a really easy way of doing this, if we skip back to our VCM editor software and we simply right click somewhere on our high octane spark advance table and we go down to row axis and we click on copy labels. What that's going to do is it's going to copy all of these row axis labels here, which is what we want, onto the clipboard. 
we can now just pop back over to our scanner software and if we highlight the current manifold absolute pressure values and then we press control V that will now paste our cylinder air mass in grams per cylinder values in as our new row axis. So now what we have is uh, a histogram that's set up with the correct load axis, the correct RPM axis and it's also just as importantly got the right break points. So basically this now replicates our ignition advance table if we look at that we've got the same RPM and we've got the same load axis. Now if we look at our histogram we can see exactly where the engine was operating during our ramp run. We can see that at the start of our run we were sitting at around about 0.6 to 0.64 grams per cylinder. As the engine moves through the rev range and we move up towards peak torque we can see our air mass increases, peaks around about 0.82 grams per cylinder and then at higher RPM actually starts to taper away. So this makes it very easy to uh, decide exactly where to make changes to your spark advance table. Now that we know how to use the scanner to decide where exactly the PCM was accessing in the ignition advance table, we may still find that the final ignition advance being delivered to the engine doesn't seem to match the numbers in the table. Now let's look at why that's the case. We're at a point here at about 5000 RPM and 0.82 grams per cylinder and you can see at this particular point we've got 22 and a half degrees ignition advance being delivered to the engine. So let's pop across to the editor and have a look at that particular point. And at 5000 RPM we're actually operating between a couple of points but you can see that our timing values appear to be uh, more in line with about 21 degrees or perhaps 21.5 degrees. So why have we got more advanced than our base table indicates? What we need to understand is that there are also a range of correction tables that are acting on top of our main spark advance tables to affect the final ignition advance being delivered to the engine. And we can find these on our spark advance tab in the VCM editor and you can see that we have a range uh, of options over here, a rain, range of tables listed under spark correction and all of these are adding up to change or affect the spark advance that's being delivered. Let's look at a couple of these now and the first one I'm going to focus on is our AFR correction. So this is a correction that is applied based on the current commanded air fuel ratio and if we open this particular table we can see that the load axis or the y axis I should say here is in units of equivalence ratio. Essentially numbers larger than one are commanding a richer air fuel ratio than stoichiometric and we can see that as we richen the air fuel ratio and reach higher RPM the uh, the correction table will start adding some timing to our base values. As well as the base AFR correction table we also have some multipliers for example here we have a manifold absolute pressure multiplier table which shows us how much of the additional advance will be added based on the manifold absolute pressure at the point the engine's running in. Let's move down and we'll have a look at our intake air temple IAT spark and this corrects the ignition advance based on the current intake air temperature. So again we have a base table and we can see we have our intake air temperature on the x-axis and we have air mass on our load axis. So we can see that this particular table, uh, particularly out here in the areas that we might end up operating at wide open throttle around about 0.76 to 0.84 grams per cylinder. Once we get above 30 degrees intake air temp the PCM will start pulling timing quite aggressively. Now this table also works with a multiplier and we can see our multiplier affects the amount of ignition advance being removed based on in this case engine RPM and intake air temperature. So depending on the operating conditions uh, we may not end up seeing all of the retard being displayed by this table actually being applied. 
We also have an engine coolant temperature uh, modifier table as well. So all of these tables here, this has just been a quick snapshot uh, of how these operate. I'm not going to go into detail on every uh, single correction that could be applied, but it's important to understand that these are working in the background and depending on your operating conditions, these can end up affecting the final spark advance being delivered to the engine. Let's pop back to the scan and we'll see how we can actually look at these particular adders or corrections. Now in this particular data log I've actually added a couple of other parameters just to demonstrate uh, the corrections in action. And we can see we've got these listed here. So we have first of all our timing advance. So this is a standard parameter that's logged by default and this is the timing being delivered to the engine. I've also logged our base advance which comes from our tables. I've also logged our IAT advance and I've logged our power enrichment or cat over temp advance. So when we look at these values you can see our base advance is sitting at 21.2 degrees which corresponds with what we saw in our, in our high octane advance table. The final timing being delivered to the engine however is 22.5 degrees and that's as a result of our power enrichment cat over temp advance correction. And that's really coming from our AFR correction table that we've just looked at as we target a richer air fuel ratio the PCM is advancing the timing slightly. So that's how our corrections can affect the final ignition timing being delivered. Of course the knock control strategy of the engine can also affect that so let's have a look at this now. Now we notice we had some knock retard being delivered here around about 5300 rpm in response to uh, a knock event. Now in itself that's relatively straightforward, we can see that we have 2 degrees of knock retard, so that's simply removed from uh, the final amount of ignition timing that was previously being delivered. However another aspect that's easy to overlook is the interaction of the high octane and the low octane spark advance tables. Let's go back to our editor and you can see under main spark advance that we have both a high octane and a low octane table. Generally we should expect to see the values in the low octane table are a lot lower than the high octane table and we can see if we put these side by side that's exactly the case uh, in high RPM operation here at very high mass airflow. We've got 19 degrees in our high octane table and we've got 9 degrees in our low octane table. So this is a safety protection aspect that the PCM can use in response to an engine that is suffering from knock. So how the, uh, the low octane and high octane tables interact can be logged by looking at a parameter we've got here called our knock learn factor. So the knock learn factor is a value that varies between 0 and 1.0. If we look a little bit earlier in our log we can see where we have no knock active our knock learn factor is sitting at 0. And when we have a value of 0 in our, as a knock learn factor this means that the PCM is operating solely on the values from our high octane advance table. If we get a lot of knock activity though this knock learn factor will start increasing and it can go all the way to 1.0. If we have a lot of knock and that knock learn factor reaches 1.0 then our base advance becomes the values in our low octane advance table. So let's have a look in the area that the engine was suffering from, from knock and we can see that our knock learn factor has now incremented to 0 0.18. So this means that the PCM is starting to bias the timing a little bit towards the uh, low octane table. For example if we had a value of 20 degrees in our high octane table, we had a value of 10 degrees in our low octane table and our knock learn factor was 0.5, we'd be getting an, a base advance value halfway between the two which is 15 degrees. So hopefully this has given you some more insight into how the ignition control strategy works inside the GM PCM. By now you should understand how to use the scanner to decide exactly whereabouts in the ignition advance tables the 
PCM is operating at any point. You should also understand how the correction tables can work to manipulate the final ignition advance being delivered. And you should understand what the knock retard function does as well as the interaction between the high octane and low octane ignition advance tables. If you've enjoyed this lesson and you'd like to learn more, check out the practical reflash tuning course that's online right now. This course starts with a general overview of the principles of reflash tuning that are applicable to reflashing on any platform and any vehicle. Right now we have worked examples online based on the HP Tuners platform and the GM LS3 we've just looked at. In this worked example you're going to learn how to optimise the fuel delivery, how to optimise the ignition timing, you're also going to see how to rescale the mass airflow sensor and you're going to see how to adjust and optimise the virtual VE tables. This is essential knowledge for anyone interested in reflashing GM vehicles on the HP Tuners platform. We also offer a 60 day no questions asked money back guarantee so there is absolutely no risk. If you buy this course and you find it's not for you, we simply refund your money. You'll also get access to our regular live tuning webinars where we cover specific tuning topics and you can ask questions in real time. If you can't watch live, you can watch these in our archive where they're added along with over 80 hours of existing content. This is the best way to fast track your tuning knowledge. If you're interested in finding out more, check out the course at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.